let me welcome you uh, this uh, afternoon, early evening, uh, to our talk on uh, trade as an engine of growth uh, for all. Uh, and uh, let me introduce uh, the, uh, the speaker. Uh, the speaker, I'm very uh, happy to say, is uh, Annabel Gonzalez, uh, who is the uh, senior director of the World Bank Group Practice on uh, Trade and uh, Competitiveness. Uh, she leads a team of about 500 people who work uh, around the world on, uh, on, on, on these issues. Um, and uh, she's uh, here in Singapore for a big World Bank now, I've known uh, Annabelle for a few years now and had the great pleasure of uh, working with her on uh, one of the World Economic Forum's uh, councils, and I can attest to uh, what an efficient and business-like uh, chairperson she is in getting business done. Uh, she's very good at herding cats. <laughs> uh, now, An Annabelle came to the World Bank uh, from a wealth of experience uh, in, uh, in trade policy. Uh, she was uh, Costa Rica's uh, trade minister uh, during a crucial period uh, and uh, before that uh, uh, senior official in trade policy in Costa Rica. Uh, she's also headed uh, one of the World Bank World, uh, Trade Organization's uh, divisions, the Division on Agriculture, and was indeed uh, a candidate for Director General of the WTO uh, in, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last round. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Lee Kuan Yew School. Annabelle, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And let me hand the mic over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Racine. And, uh, and I appreciate uh, very much uh, the, uh, the, invitation, uh, the invitation to come here and, uh, and join you uh, and to speak about a topic that is, uh, I think, of great relevance uh, to, uh, to the world today, which is uh, how to make trade uh, work, uh, work for, for all. So um, I'd like to uh, start uh, my, my conversation with you today uh, with a short uh, story about a small, uh, about a small country. Uh, a small country which has managed uh, over decades uh, to sustain high growth uh, and to improve the lives uh, of its uh, people. Uh, it is a country that has uh, long seen uh, economic openness as central to its uh, development. It has provided a, a stable business environment it has uh, struck trade agreements uh, with its uh, key partners. It has attracted uh, foreign uh, uh, investors that have generated a large number of jobs uh, and that have fostered innovation in the local economy. Now, this is not the Singapore uh, story. Uh, it is the story of my home country, uh, Costa Rica, as uh, Racine was uh, saying, where I was trade minister before coming uh, to, the, um, to the World Bank Group. And what links uh, the stories of uh, Singapore and uh, Costa Rica is that uh, openness to the global economy has always been central uh, to uh, their prosperity. Um, it is probably uh, to you know, no surprise than, you know, that uh, for me, and I guess probably for many of you in this uh, room, there is no doubt that trade is a powerful uh, driver of uh, economic uh, growth and uh, prosperity uh, and, po and uh, poverty reduction. Uh, no country, as, we, as, uh, as you know, has grown on a sustained basis uh, without trading with others. Now, despite this, we are uh, in a challenging global environment uh, on trade, uh, with much debate over the directions of the global economy um, uh, and where it should go uh, in the future. So today, we are basically being challenged to re-examine uh, the evidence on the role that trade plays in the global economy. Uh, and at the World Bank Group, we believe that the evidence is clear. Uh, when it comes uh, to trade, we do not need to choose between inclusion and growth. Trade has been central to the economic transformation of many countries in recent decades, leading to sustained growth uh, and poverty reduction. Merchandise trade as a share of uh, world GDP grew from around 30% in 1988 to around 50% uh, in 2013. And during this period of uh, rapid globalization, average income grew by 24% globally. The global poverty headcount ratio declined from 35% to close to 10%. And the income of the bottom 40% of the world population increased by close to 50%. And we know these success stories. 
You take Vietnam, for example. Extreme poverty uh, was 64% in 1993. It is 3% uh, today, a period that saw the country's trade growth uh, uh, trade grow to more than 150% of GDP. Uh, if you take India, where services have played a central role, economic growth of between 6 and 7% uh, has helped reduce extreme poverty from 50% in 1994 to less than 20% in 2015. And these numbers, of course, are not just about economics. These are basically about people, because less poverty means better lives for men, women, uh, and children that call these places home. Now, as well as reducing, uh, trade po uh, tra uh, reducing poverty, trade has helped build a more inclusive global economy. Globalization has brought developing countries from marginal to central participants uh, in world trade. Developing countries now account for around uh, one half of uh, global trade, up to from uh, about one third in the year 2000. And they have absorbed uh, about half uh, of all foreign direct uh, investment. Now, this same link between uh, trade and global inclusion uh, is evident when we look at global inequality in incomes. In other words, at the gap between the lowest and the highest income people in the world. And contrary to what is often assumed, uh, according to recent uh, research by the uh, World Bank, global inequality in incomes has declined since 1990 after rising since the 1820s. And the causes for this are complex uh, for sure, but economic openness uh, and the global spread of technology has almost certainly played uh, a role. The convergence process, however, is far from complete, as we well know. Now, while trade has promoted a more inclusive global economy and has helped uh, lift millions of people out of poverty, we know that some people have been left behind. And they are concerned that the rising tide uh, has not lifted all boats. Moreover, within con countries, inequality has uh, risen in most advanced uh, economies since the 1990s and until the mid-2000s. Uh, Whereas in developing countries, it remains high even as, is, even as it has declined in recent uh, uh, decades in many of them. Now, along with the rapid uh, economic shifts uh, brought about uh, by technological change and sudden increases in, uh, in import competition in some sectors and economies, this concern has driven the increasingly vocal calls uh, that we hear today uh, about globalization. So is it, it is in this context that I would like to speak uh, about the current trade environment uh, and the challenges that we face uh, in using trade to support growth uh, and reduce poverty. And I would like to conclude by setting some, sharing some ideas about uh, what can we do uh, to address uh, this challenge. So first, on the global trade environment, there are three aspects uh, to address. The relationship between global GDP and trade growth, uh, the impact of uh, technological change, and the pace of trade liberalization. So let me refer a little bit to each one of them. The global economy as a whole is in a period of uh, strengthening growth. Uh, the recovery in, gro in uh, global growth, uh, which has been underway since uh, mid last year, uh, continued in the first half of this year. Uh, and the slow recovery uh, in global uh, trade has played, uh, and the, I'm sorry, the slow recovery in global trade has played a role uh, in the recovery of growth. But it is not really the engine of growth that it once was. In the past, uh, trade was actually one of the key engines uh, of, uh, of the global economy. In the two decades uh, before the global financial crisis, trade outpaced uh, global GDP growth by some three percentage points. Uh, and several factors uh, drove this trend, including structural reforms that lowered uh, trade barriers, a dr dramatic decline in uh, communication costs, uh, and a rapid uh, deepening of uh, global supply chains. Low- and middle-income countries benefited in particular. Uh, their trade in the decade and a half before the global financial crisis grew by 9.3%, 2.5% higher uh, than world exports, making trade uh, a powerful driver of inclusive development. But the trade growth engine has been sputtering uh, since the global financial crisis. And this rec recent uh, weakness in uh, trade growth 
is linked partly to short-term economic trends like uh, lower commodity prices, as well as longer-term uh, trends uh, like the maturation of uh, global value chains. And unpacking the causes uh, is complex um, and has been a focus of uh, research uh, at the World Bank uh, uh, and at the team that I lead. But the story of the trade slowdown uh, is not just about longer-term uh, trends. Uh, it's not only it's not just about the, uh, about this uh, uh, longer term trends, but policies have also uh, played a key role. And I will come back later to this uh, when um, when I talk about the need to implement. When I'll talk about the need to implement um, policy reforms that allow trade to take a more central uh, role uh, in uh, in global growth. Now, a second key element uh, of the trade context uh, is the impact of technological change uh, on the global economy and on trade. Two weeks ago, we launched a report on, um, we call it uh, uh, Trouble in the Making, the future, uh, the impact of technology in the future of manufacturing-led uh, growth. Um, the spread of global production networks in manufacturing has been a key driver of global trade and of development in recent decades, as we know. Lower income countries have relied on uh, manufacturing, which provides jobs for unskilled workers, uh, helps increase productivity, and drives economic growth as a central driver of uh, development. However, the increasing adoption of uh, industrial automation, uh, advanced robotics, smart factories, the Internet of Things, uh, 3D printing, uh, and others are transforming the manufacturing process and changing the landscape of global production. The criteria for becoming an attractive uh, production location uh, are changing. And increasingly, it is not access to low-cost uh, labor, but access to technology, um, cutting-edge services, uh, and data, data that are among the top considerations uh, for manufacturing firms. Now, although dramatic um, media reports of uh, massive job losses due to automation may be overblown. In fact, according to the report, uh, when occupations are, bro are broken down into tasks with varying levels of autom automobility, the threat of automation of today's uh, jobs may be in the range of uh, 6 to 12 percent for OECD countries and a more modest uh, 2 to 8 percent. Uh, for developing uh, countries. Nevertheless, there is no doubt that uh, technological change is already bringing major changes to the global economy and that these are likely to intensify. The structure of global value chains is uh, evolving, in part due to these technological shifts which have made domestic manufacturing uh, relatively less, uh, less costly. Now, a third element of the global context um, is the weak prospects for trade liberalization at the global and regional levels. And here, I think it's useful if we turn our, our minds back to the recent past, to the year 2016. Um, in Nairobi, for example, the WTO had just held its sex second successful ministerial conference in a row, uh, following a successful uh, 2013 Bali uh, conference where the trade facilitation agreement was concluded. In, in Nairobi, uh, multilateral decisions were reached uh, on long-standing issues like ending uh, agricultural export subsidies. Uh, and the way ahead in uh, the WTO was not simple, but momentum had been reached uh, through two successful ministerial conferences following years of deadlock in the, uh, in the Doha round. Back in early 2016, there was also momentum on plurilateral initiatives uh, like the Trade in Services Agreement and the Environmental Goods Agreement, uh, building on the success achieved uh, in Nairobi in expanding the plurilateral agreement, uh, the Information Technology uh, Agreement. And perhaps uh, most notable, and of course for, very important for this part of the world, in February 2016, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement was signed in, uh, in, uh, in February. So today, uh, we are looking at a, at a very different uh, picture. Uh, despite the success of the WTO Trade Facilitation uh, Agreement entering into force, there seems to be uh, few prospects for uh, multilateral deals at the WTO. Uh, the plurilateral initiatives uh, have uh, stalled, and the TPP has not entered uh, into force. Um, moreover, significant trade policy risks uh, loom in the horizon. 
uh, following a famous uh, Australian movie. I was trying to think as an Australian colleague of mine who's here uh, today, and he helped me put this uh, uh, together. So I was thinking, how can I bring Australia into this picture? So then I found this uh, 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 great movie, uh, Australian, called uh, The Year of Living Dangerously. And I thought that uh, if we think about 2017, maybe it's the year of living dangerously in, uh, in, trade, uh, in trade policy. And uh, trade policy, as we know, is um, under scrutiny with new uh, challenges uh, developing for an open uh, rules-based uh, trading system due mostly to protectionist pressures uh, in advanced uh, countries. So the lack of uh, momentum uh, in the last uh, 18 months or so is particularly acute. Uh, but it also reflects uh, longer-run uh, trends of diminished trade liberalization since the early uh, 2000s. In the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, growing WTO membership uh, allowed countries, uh, most notably China, to rapidly integrate into the global trading system. And this was also a period when uh, global supply chains uh, were rapidly spreading in Asia, in Europe, and in uh, North America. Uh, applied tariffs fell from average of nearly 30% to less than 15% in emerging and uh, developing uh, countries, and from 10% to less than 5% uh, in advanced uh, countries. Uh, since the early 2000s, uh, the pace of liberalization uh, slowed significantly. Uh, there was almost no further reductions in advanced uh, economies, and less than a third um, the reduction in emerging and developing countries then took place between this period of uh, 1990s uh, to the early 2000s. So notwithstanding uh, uh, trade's uh, central role uh, in the global economy, we basically find ourselves today in a time where there is not uh, the energy in trade liberalization that, uh, there, once, uh, uh, that there, uh, there once was. So despite all this, I think that we need to put the slowdown in trade, uh, the challenges posed by uh, rapidly changing technology, and the relative loss of energy uh, in trade liberalization uh, in context. You know, recently, and particularly if you look at the, the media and some commentators have uh, been speaking of the risk of deglobalization. So we should not be complacent, uh, for sure. But when we remind ourselves of the wider uh, context, uh, this may seem a bit uh, extreme, uh, I think. Uh, trade and investment are still central uh, to the global economy. Uh, since 1950, the share of uh, uh, GDP made up by trade and the volume of world trade have increased uh, significantly. Uh, in 2015, uh, global merchandise trade in value terms was uh, $16.4 trillion. Uh, in volume terms, this is uh, three times larger uh, than in 1990. And foreign direct investment, increasingly intertwined with uh, trade, has grown almost uh, sevenfold uh, during this uh, period. So, as I said, at at the outs outset, uh, this has been coupled with much greater participation from um, uh, developing countries in the global economy and rapid declines uh, in poverty. So in my view, globalization is here to stay. But the slowdown in trade growth and in trade liberalization point to the need to do more if we are to reset the full potential of re-energizing inclusive uh, growth and, uh, and reducing poverty. In this final part of my remarks, uh, I would like to touch on four ways in which I think we can address uh, these challenges. Reinvigorating trade cooperation, bringing about the next wave of developing country uh, integration into world trade, strengthening our focus on uh, inclusion, and improving competitiveness. So the first priority uh, needs to be reinvigorating trade cooperation. At the multilateral level, as I was mentioning, we had had consecutive WTO ministerial conferences in 2013 and 2015 that delivered significant uh, results, even if they fell short of expectations that once existing for completing the Doha round. Uh, and although the multilateral climate is difficult, there is an urgent need uh, to define a new uh, path forward in the WTO. And this should be, in, in my view, focused on achieving results both on long-standing issues where trade barriers uh, remain high, like agriculture, as well as in new areas uh, like the digital economy. And although the plurilateral um, trade services and trade in environmental goods uh, and negotiations have stalled, as I mentioned, this type of negotiation uh, involving less than the whole WTO membership uh, can present a way of advancing into new areas uh, of trade rulemaking. 
The aim of new plurilateral negotiations uh, should be extending the benefits of new agreements to all WTO uh, members. Now, regional trade agreements are also uh, essential, complementing multilateral trade uh, opening through the WTO. And although the TPP remains uh, in limbo, its implementation has uh, the potential to inject much needed growth into the global economy by lowering trade barriers in important economies. There will also be the potential for new members to join the agreement or to implement the standards uh, set in TPP. Other large uh, agreements like the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership negotiations have an important role to play. Uh, and in order to maximize the positive impact of these RTAs, they should remain open and inclusive uh, and focus on extending the benefits of open markets uh, to as many economies uh, as possible. They also need to be comprehensive in their approach because the evidence is clear, and this is also part of uh, um, uh, some research that we've done uh, at, uh, with our teams, the evidence is clear that deeper integration between economies, especially in areas like regulatory cooperation, leads to greater trade and investment. Moreover, other initiatives on regional, inter uh, regional cooperation, like the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, uh, this ambitious effort launched by China to improve cooperation and connectivity on a transcontinental scale, could also be instrumental in boosting trade and investment across uh, 60, the 65 countries that are part of this initiative in the broader Eurasian uh, region. Second, uh, I believe we need to, be, to bring about the next wave of developing country integration into world trade. Bringing many emerging uh, and lower income economies into global trade has been an important source of growth and dynamism in recent decades. And we mentioned the case of Vietnam, uh, for example. Trade has been central to remarkable declines in extreme poverty in Asia. Uh, and in that period uh, that uh, this region was rapidly integrating into the global economy, the number of extreme poor living under uh, $1.90 a day uh, fell from 966 million in 1990 to 71 million in 2013. And this is really very impressive. In South Asia, the number of extreme poor, poor fell from 505 million in 1996 to about half to 256 million in 2013. However, low income countries as a group still face trade costs that are around three times higher than advanced economies. And this high trade cost mean that firms that might otherwise trade and invest in these markets of more than 600 million people will go uh, elsewhere. So the reasons vary, uh, but include poor road networks, weak logistics, inadequate port facilities, antiquated customs procedures, uh, corrupt corruption at border crossings, and uh, outdated legal and regulatory structures. So tackling the sources of this uh, trade cost would make firms in developing countries more competitive, allowing them to benefit more from trade opportunities. Now, trade, which involves uh, streamlining border uh, clearance uh, procedures, is one of the most important ways of reducing uh, trade costs. Uh, so take uh, Cambodia, for example, which is a country where we have been working uh, for the past number of years. Um, through reforms uh, to improve transparency and strengthen coordination among border agencies, Cambodia cut border clearance times from six days to 1.4 days over just a few years climbing more than 40 pages, 40 places uh, in the bank's logistics performance index. And though it's still not Singapore, for sure, this is big progress for uh, Cambodia and has supported uh, the country's growing export competitiveness uh, in manufacturing. So lowering trade costs also means improving infrastructure alongside reforms to open markets and uh, streamlined trade. Uh, better roads and rail, upgraded ports and, uh, and airports, uh, and investments in IP ICT infrastructure are all essential. However, there has been a growing awareness uh, that the infrastructure uh, deficit in developing countries is well beyond what can be met through public uh, financial institutions like the World Bank Group. Although we are bringing ever greater financial resources to bear, uh, like our, our record, record uh, sending $75 billion uh, replenishment of, uh, our, um, of the International Development uh, Association, which is our fund 
support the world's uh, poorest, we also need to make sure that every dollar uh, goes uh, further. So our approach to infrastructure financing is to use our resources as effectively as possible to crowd in pub, uh, private financing for development. This means investments uh, like our support for power generation in Turkey over a decade, where $5 billion in bank group commitments help unlock $55 billion in private investment. It also means intensifying our support to improve the investment climate in developing countries to lower the risks that are faced by private uh, investors. So these are the core elements of a strategy to bring about the next wave of developing country integration into world trade uh, through reducing trade costs. And hopefully we can see Ethiopia or Kenya or Rwanda or Sudan uh, benefit from uh, an open or participation in the global economy in the same way as a country like Vietnam did uh, years ago. So the third broad response uh, to the challenges uh, facing globalization is to strengthen our focus on inclusion. Uh, we need to make sure that all groups are connected to the potential benefits of trade and that when people experience negative impacts, these are addressed. So although trade and investment liberalization have overwhelmingly positive uh, effects overall, they do come with uh, negative consequences uh, in, some, uh, in some cases um, for specific industries, for specific regions, and for specific uh, groups. I remember that uh, Pascal Lamy, the former WTO Director General, uh, used to say that uh, trade uh, works because it hurts, uh, uh, and it hurts because it works. Uh, and that is probably uh, true. But, you know, aside from the negative impact of, uh, of this uh, cost, if left unaddressed, this cost can impact growth in itself and can also sap public policy support, uh, public support for policies uh, of openness. So as we look to the next phase of uh, globalization, uh, we will need to sharpen our understanding of the impact of trade on employment and uh, wages and what and what does and doesn't work in uh, implementing policies of adjustment. We have some examples of what seems to work well. For example, the model of flexible labor markets uh, and strong unemployment benefits in, uh, in, their, in their mark is frequently cited. Uh, but far more examples of adjustment policies uh, are ineffective. And this is especially a big problem for uh, developing countries, uh, which are the least equipped uh, to manage the process of, uh, trade, uh, uh, of trade adjustment. So in addition to adjustment, we need to focus on connecting more people to the potential gains of trade. This includes people in isolated rural communities, those working in the informal sector, and those in fragile and conflict-affected um, uh, states. Within this context, the agenda to connect uh, women uh, more fully to the benefits of trade uh, is especially important. Trade has brought real benefits uh, for women in terms of jobs and empowerment. Uh, and there are many positive examples. If we go back again to Cambodia, for instance, uh, the export-oriented garment sector is one of the main uh, providers of uh, wage employment. And 85% of total garment industry workers are women. Um, women in the garment sector uh, receive relatively higher wages uh, than those employed in other uh, sectors. Uh, girls in Indian villages, for example, uh, where business process outsourcing increased employment among young women, were more likely to be in school than girls in villages where there was no such links uh, through trade. Uh, by contrast, such trade links did not affect the probability of boys being in school. And across developing countries, exporting firms generally employ a significant higher share of uh, women than non-exporting firms. However, women continue to face uh, significantly, uh, significant inequality of opportunity, uh, both, within, um, both within and outside uh, the household, which can make it bit, uh, difficult uh, to gain from trade opportunities. For example, uh, we have another uh, great project, or very important project in the Great Lakes, uh, trade in the Great Lakes uh, uh, area, a, a project on trade facilitation, where 85% of small-scale traders are women. Uh, but the majority of border officials are men, uh, with corruption and gender-based uh, abuse common. So other types of gender inequality can affect the gains uh, women experience from trade, uh, like the segmentation of women in certain occupations. And we have seen this again in our studies, 
where, for example, um, uh, agriculture um, uh, women in, uh, workers in Honduras are, are women, but they are seldom owners of land. Uh, or while women may be employees, for instance, at call centers in Egypt, uh, they are rarely managers. And the story goes uh, uh, on, uh, on and on. So strengthen, uh, strengthening the legitimacy of uh, trade openness, and more importantly, maximizing the economic gains, means addressing the barriers that limit women from participating more fully in the benefits of trade. It also means uh, ensuring that small businesses, not just large, large firms, can succeed in the global economy. While small and medium-sized uh, companies are important contributors to employment and uh, output in the majority of countries, their participation in international trade is still limited. Uh, global value chains and e-commerce are valuable platforms for SMEs to seize uh, the gains from global trade, uh, including increased productivity. But public policies are needed to ensure SMEs embrace integration into the global market trade, including reducing trade costs uh, and barriers to cross-border investment, as well as strengthening the conditions for firms' growth and productivity upgrade. And finally, I think we need to do more to build competitiveness alongside reports to open uh, markets. Uh, and uh, with uh, Racine some years ago in the context of our work in, uh, in the um, uh, World Economic Forum, and the Global Competitiveness Council on Competitiveness, we produced a piece on the importance of trade and competitiveness working together. Uh, and this, of course, means that the agenda uh, encompasses a range of behind-the-border uh, uh, policy areas, uh, like innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, or skills and education. Um, investing in this is essential for boosting productivity and ensuring that uh, people and businesses can take advantage of the opportunity presented by openness. Uh, a strong focus on pro-competitiveness uh, reforms also helps economies uh, build the resilience that they need to respond to economic shock, whether brought about by trade, by technology, or other shocks. Experience teaches us that uh, open, growing economies, uh, where new jobs are created, are much better equipped to deal with adjustment than those that are uncompetitive and stagnant. So by working more across these four areas, reinvigorating trade crop cooperation, bringing about the next wave of developing country integration into world trade, strengthening our focus on uh, inclusion, and improving competitiveness, I believe that we can set a path for the next uh, phase of globalization. Our goal in all, uh, in all this is not to unlock new drivers of globalization or boost trade as ends in themselves. Uh, as the stories of Costa Rica, Singapore, and many other countries uh, show, openness to the global economy, coupled with complementary measures, is indispensable. So if we think about this like trade 2.0, uh, this can probably help us reset uh, trade as an engine for inclusive gro growth, uh, job creation, and poverty eradication. Thank you. Thank you, Annabel, for uh, such a wide-ranging talk uh, where you emphasized uh, uh, the, the centrality of trade and trade openness in various contexts. Let's uh, open it up to uh, the floor. My name is Mark Thomas. Um, I'm from New Zealand, so we've been... Uh, big card-carrying members of the Free Trade Club from both sides of the political spectrum uh, until recently, yeah. like many countries. Um, my question is, given the compelling benefits for trade, as you've w well enunciated, what do you think have been the key public policy or political failures in the last few years? And I, pr I appreciate it, it, it's problematic to generalise, um, but if we think about perhaps the US and Europe, where perhaps at least most of the, of the big media noise is, what do you think have been the really big as I say, public policy and political failures that have caused, as you say, uh, the World Trade Organization and others to re-examine the benefits um, so assiduously. The first point that I, you know, that I, that I like to, to make when I refer to this topic is that I think that the backlash that we see against globalization is mostly in advanced countries. Uh, when you go to many developing countries, uh, it is you know, more like, well, how can we connect uh, to the global economy. It's more like, you know, what, what do we need to do to be part of this? Because there is a clear understanding uh, that with that, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, incomes increase, new job opportunities uh, uh, come up, etc. Now, I think that uh, in it, the, the reasons are, are complex. Uh, there's not one single reason. Uh, and there, you know, the manifestations and the reasons per se may be different. I think in the case of the U.S. is the perception that many have been left behind. Uh, if you go to some regions uh, in the U.S., in certain industries uh, in particular, and uh, particularly for wor uh, workers that are, uh, you know, within certain populations group, uh, they feel that be it new technologies or through trade or through the effect of trade on technology, the two of them coming together, uh, that, uh, you know, the jobs that they had uh, and which allowed them to get, you know, to have own one house and two cars, and to put their kids through college if they wish, that that future is no longer there. Huh? Um, and it, it, you know, if you look at, uh, at uh, the numbers, there's also um, this, uh, this famous uh, elephant curve, which I don't know if you've seen by uh, 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 Branko Milanovic, which basically shows, yes, that the benefits uh, have concentrated in a, a part of the population, whereas this middle income part uh, has received less benefits in the recent term. So, some people also argue uh, that the fact that the U.S. Does not, has not put in place certain types of policies uh, um, uh, makes uh, the impact of, uh, uh, of these changes in technology and or trade uh, more significant for this part of the population. So there's a big discussion about, you know, uh, health care, for instance, in the U.S., social safety nets more broadly, and, and even thinking about, you know, do you need to put in place uh, regional policies like they have in some places in, uh, in uh, Europe. I think it, what we see in Europe is different. Mm, I don't think it's the same. Uh, I don't think that Brexit is related in, you know, in no way to the UK not wanting to, you know, have a, 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 an open trade policy. Uh, I, I don't, I, you don't hear that in Germany either, for instance. Uh, uh, it's more about uh, the question of immigration uh, and how immigration uh, is putting um, some of their, um, their, you know, some some of their core sort of uh, um, uh, livelihoods, if you wish, uh, a little bit in in, in question. Huh? Uh, and you see it even in the discussion of the German election. That was a, a, a big issue. So, and then the manifestation is not like what we're seeing in the U.S., which seems to be more on the protectionist side uh, on trade. In the in the uh, in Europe, it, in some countries in Europe. Uh, it's not. It's not really that, uh, but it's more. You know, some nationalist uh, forces uh, being strengthened uh, in the current context. So I think for each country, uh, is uh, is different. You also have uh, some advanced countries like Canada, where you don't see this happening. And in the contrary, is Canada trying to embrace? Uh, you know, the opportunities that are that are being happening. Uh, so I guess it's. Um, Yes, there are some, maybe some core elements, and they relate to, okay, so how can you really make trade? I mean, how can countries in the, you know, in the context of, uh, of huge change coming from technology or coming from trade, how can countries make sure uh, that they prepare themselves and their citizens to be able to mitigate uh, some of the risks associated with uh, the changes, but also take advantage of those opportunities? Thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Ahmed Kumbatov. I'm a junior MPP student from Russia. Uh, I'm coming, since I'm coming from the energy sector, uh, I would like to admit that I'm very much fascinated by the uh, Costa Rican renewable energy success story. Uh, my question is about, um, about uh, inequality. Uh, so basically you mentioned uh, that uh, inequality is decreasing actually. And uh, recently, like a couple of weeks ago, I came across a report by the World Economic Forum, and I know you're a member, uh, one of the councils there, uh, that uh, one of the flagship uh, projects, which is annual report on uh, global risk or something, mm -hmm. and, and, and there actually uh, inequality was mentioned as a top uh, problem, actually, and challenge, uh, which uh, will be accompanying uh, world economic development uh, in the near decade, actually, and I would like to uh, learn your perspective on, on that report and the difference between this position? Normally when, you know, when there's talk about inequality, I think people refer to different things. Um, I was mentioning that uh, global inequality, that is if you look at all people in the world uh, have uh, diminished. And the reason for that is basically because many people have been lifted out of poverty. 
Uh, now, the reality is that the, you know, there's still much to be done uh, for, uh, for convergence uh, to happen. There are still uh, you know, uh, l over 800 uh, billion people living in poverty. And until those people come out of poverty, you will not see further uh, decreases in, uh, in global inequality. Now, inequality within countries uh, is the one uh, that has uh, increased, particularly in advanced countries. In some developing countries, in, in actually, in, um, we, had, we did a study in the bank, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, that showed that in uh, 40 out of 60 developing countries, inequality within countries had decreased, though it still, um, it still was at relatively high levels. Huh? So uh, inequality is a very complex, uh, it's a very complex uh, phenomenon. Now, I think the point that uh, the World Economic Forum was making in that, um, in that uh, report is that indeed it, inequality as we, you know, within countries is uh, still, and even if you think about it, uh, global inequality as well, uh, it is an important uh, risk. The fact that, you know, a number of countries do not provide opportunities for their people to stay within their own countries and they migrate, this a bit of the forced migration that we are seeing to Europe, is an important uh, risk uh, uh, to the global economy, and that is fueled in part uh, by inequality considerations. Uh, likewise, part of the public policy response that we see in the U.S. today uh, relates to inequality within the U.S. as well. So the forum is right, but the point that I was trying to make is that, you know, for, since the 1820s uh, until the 1990s, uh, we basically saw global inequality not change much. But it's in the past uh, 20 to 20 something years uh, where we have seen that this global inequality has decreased and it is related basically to this participation of developing countries in global trade. My question is here. How, how have been the cooperation between Costa Rica and Singapore? And with, uh, what is the opportunity the rest of Central America like Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras we have to cooperate in the future with Singapore? And where we can improve to do better? Thank you very much. I think that Singapore is a country that all countries can learn uh, from, uh, from Singapore. Um, I will tell you a, a very interesting uh, story uh, uh, building from, uh, from the time when I was in, uh, in government in Costa Rica, which is we started to work with the, um, with the Chinese and uh, uh, in particular with the China Development Bank to, um, to do a feasibility study to establish uh, Chinese uh, special economic zones in Costa Rica. Um, looking at, you know, uh, China does not have special economic zones in, uh, uh, in Latin America. They have them, of course, in other parts of the world, uh, in Vietnam, certainly Africa, etc., but not in Latin America. So we're looking at saying, okay, so how can we uh, do uh, something like this, but uh, in a way that it becomes a model, uh, including from the environmental and uh, uh, from a sustainability uh, perspective more broadly. So um, we basically came to uh, Singapore, uh, knowing that uh, Singapore had uh, worked with China since many, many years ago uh, in developing uh, special economic zones in, uh, in uh, China. Uh, and uh, we met with the government of Singapore and with a number of uh, firms here in uh, Singapore uh, to discuss, you know, could this be a trilateral effort, uh, Costa Rica, China, uh, Singapore. Uh, to uh, work in this uh, area. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, this is a, a, a good example. And then, uh, well, I, I, I came out of office, uh, but the process, uh, I understand, has uh, continued. And it's a, it's a project that I think will take some time to materialize. But I think it shows how, you know, a country like Costa Rica, but other Central American countries could actually learn uh, from the Singapore experience that I think is, is, is extremely valuable. Huh? So, um, you know, sometimes when countries are in one part of the world, they tend to look at experiences within their region. Fortunately, in our region, mm, it's better to look at other uh, regions. Uh, so, you know, uh, not fortunately, but I mean it, in the sense that it provides opportunities to look at what other uh, countries like Singapore have, uh, have done. Huh? By the way, New Zealand is another great example of a small, uh, a small country that, uh, that has done very well and trade being, uh, of course, a driver of that. International trade is an area where Africa has underperformed and continues to underperform. I think outside of South Africa, the continent remains 
fully integrated into global value chains. And the rules of the game for trade changing, uh, Africa risks being left further behind. What can the continent do or what does the World Bank have in mind to sort of firstly assist the continent to catch up and then enable them to participate? I think the, the African, most African countries need to accelerate the reforms uh, very quickly because uh, I do think that, uh, you know, there is, still, there is still a window of opportunity uh, for, for, for many African countries uh, to, you know, participate in global value chains. I'm always very impressed by, for instance, what a country like Ethiopia uh, is doing. Uh, we, we did a case study of uh, Ethiopia. They recently brought in uh, investments for $1 billion, uh, a, a conglomerate led by the largest uh, textile firms in the U.S., but including companies uh, from China, from India, from other places. Uh, and this conglomerate of 35 um, uh, companies uh, have uh, established in uh, special economic zones that they've, uh, that they've built, and they will soon, they've actually started to uh, export uh, mostly garments, and uh, I think it is by next year that they will reach uh, $1 billion in, uh, in uh, exports uh, from, uh, from Ethiopia. Now, um, I do think that that shows that uh, it can be done, uh, but a number of uh, policy measures need to be put in place uh, for, that, uh, for that to happen. Um, if we look at other countries in the region, I think you also see some interesting examples uh, in uh, Kenya, uh, for example. Um, now, other countries in the region are not necessarily going in that, uh, in that direction, and some of the policies that they are putting in place do not necessarily favor uh, participation in global, uh, in global value chains. So, uh, so if I have to give one recommendation, which is probably very broad and uh, it should be tailored to each country, it would mean uh, you know, to speed up uh, the, uh, the implementation of reforms to be able, you know, to sort of put a foot in the door, uh, particularly on the manufacturing uh, space, so that when uh, new technologies are fully implemented, they already will be there and they, it would be easier to move, uh, if you wish, to a more, I mean, the bar will be set higher, I think, in the future. So if you do not start now, it would be much more difficult in, uh, in the future. I'd like you to so compare uh, two developing country regions that have not so far had a globalization backlash uh, and have broadly benefited from trade and globalization, but in very different ways. That's very broadly East Asia and mm -hmm. Latin, Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the benefits seem to have been greater and more widespread. Mm -hmm in East Asia, mm -hmm. uh, and of course East Asia is one of the three hubs of global value chains, uh, whereas it seems to have been more uneven in Latin America. Mm -hmm. what, what might the future look like for both, and what can they learn from each other? Well, I think that mm, East Asia is, in a way, better place than uh, Latin America, uh, you know, to, to deal with the future. The reason being that this enormous progress that has been made for the past uh, 20 years has prepared uh, the region well in terms of rising educational levels, improvement of the business climate, enhancing of, competitive, of connectedness, this is a region that is highly connected, uh, and it's continuously investing in, uh, in improving connectedness. Uh, so, you know, if you look at capabilities, competitiveness in a broader sense, and connectedness, I think this region is relatively well placed. Uh, and I have with me my manager uh, for trade, uh, who happens to be from Brazil. Uh, which is, uh, of course, the probably the, I mean, it's, it's the largest and probably the most important country in Latin America. If you go to Latin America, much of the growth in uh, in recent years, which has been very beneficial, which was beneficial for Latin America, was in commodity, uh, driven, of course, by uh, by the Chinese demand uh, for uh, for commodities, and that is a model of growth that has limitations. Uh? Uh, it has limitations, and most Latin American countries have not been successful, uh, you know, in building from participation in commodities to try to move to another level. 
Some of them have, and I'm going to put, for example, uh, the case of Chile, uh, who, you know, a large uh, copper pro producer, uh, of course, and copper is still very important in their economy, but they have developed a number of services related to, uh, to copper, and now they are exporting services, uh, you know, all over the world. And you have also, you know, examples like Australia, I mean, other com countries that were driven, you know, by, by natural resources. But I feel that Latin America still needs to, um, uh, to work in these three areas that I was mentioning. Uh, capabilities. Uh, yes, mm, you know, uh, there's, uh, most uh, children go to school in Latin America, but Latin American countries tend to perform very poorly, uh, for instance, in the PISA test uh, from, uh, from OECD. Um, uh, in terms of uh, competitiveness, whereas uh, many countries in East Asia rank high, uh, most countries in Latin America are in the middle, you know, uh, competitiveness is not really uh, their, their, their forte. Huh? And if you include innovation in there, it's, uh, it's another area of a great challenge for Latin America. And finally, in terms of uh, connectedness, um, the infrastructure gap in, uh, in most Latin American countries is still quite big. So as much as I would like to say, because my heart is there, that I see a great future uh, for Latin America, I want to say that I see a great future for implementing policy reforms uh, if they want to benefit from, from what the future is bringing. You know, lacking that, mm, I think that, uh, that it will not be that, uh, that easy. But Jose, I want to bring you, I want to bring you in uh, uh, because uh, this is a topic that he and I, we have discussed uh, uh, many times. Uh. You have, uh, you have some emerging trends that are super interesting in the Pacific Alliance, the so-called Pacific Alliance, four mm -hmm. countries that are uh, three of them uh, in the TPP, uh, the fourth one, Colombia, wanting to, to go. And they are really doing uh, new things. And you have the Southern America, where you have Brazil and Argentina, which are kind of the late comers to the globalization process. No? I mean, they, they have been protected, etc. A little bit like South Africa. I think that South Africa has the same. It's the, I mean, so big countries, middle income, uh, natural resource rich, but, uh, but at the same time, far away from the hubs mm -hmm. of the globalization process. So, yeah. so there are specific challenges for these countries. How to integrate the global value chain, how to, 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 to connect, actually, to, to the world. All of them are, they are, uh, 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 emerging signals of, uh, of trying to, 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 to open up, but, uh, but they are still uh, at the beginning. Uh, that we are doing a report to Argent of, for Argentina as well in this, in this direction. So I, my view is that the, uh, one, one possible way is uh, regional integration. And this comes to your question about Africa as well. I think that exploring mo more the, pos the possible avenues of regional inter integration, integration through services could be something that uh, could benefit these countries in the, in the long run. Mm. But this is only an idea to add to those that uh, Annabelle uh, suggested. Do you think this is just cyclical? I mean, it's, it's perhaps 80% the US and, and a smaller amount the rest of the world. Do you think this is just a cycle that sometimes happens in international affairs? Are you optimistic? Uh, I want to think that yes, that this is a <laughs> short term. Uh, uh, I mean, some of the issues are there and they will need to address it. But, uh, but I remember the 1980s, you know, and there was a lot of uh, backlash uh, in that, at that time, uh, concern about Japan, that Japan would uh, somehow, you know, uh, sort of uh, buy all of the U.S. And there were a lot of concerns at, at, at that moment. And, you know, that proved not, not, you know, not to be the case and things sort of like, you know, went back to, to, to normal. Uh, I hope that uh, this time, uh, you know, the, you know, it, yes, that this will, um, this, this, you know, the, this year of living dangerously maybe, maybe won't last uh, for, uh, for long. Thank you. Thank you very much for first your talk, Annabelle, and then for rich answers to uh, lots of interesting questions. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much.